And now the second part of this fascinating interview with Damien Riedel, lawyer, technologist, musician, and speaker. I was at the conference where, where we discussed a different topic. It was whether generative AI will or can replace judges. Uh, this was a very good discussion. Um, and there were uh, supporters saying that we need faster justice. Uh, if we have an appeal to a human being, it's uh, acceptable. And some people saying not at all. What's your point? Uh, how would you uh, answer to this question? Yeah, I worked for two judges, one at the district court level and one at the appellate court level. And my work as a judicial law clerk was to bring in the party's uh, briefs. Uh, and I would then summarize, uh, say a brief would have five claims. I would say for each of those claims, claim number one, plaintiff says, defendant says, judge, I think you should say. And then I do the same thing for claim number two. Plaintiff says, defendant says, judge, you should say. The problem is the plaintiff says it on page one and the defendant says it on page 20. So being able to connect those dots is very long and time consuming for any judicial clerk. Uh, it turns out that a large language model can do that very easily. So what I'm building right now and will be rolling out soon is a way to be able to do that judicial memo, just like I did as a law clerk. The plaintiff said, defendant said, judge, maybe you should say, um, to do that in maybe minutes not hours. Like that memo would take me 10 hours as a human, but maybe that first draft of the memo could be done in minutes. Uh, that is not deciding the case, but that is merely acting as the judicial clerk, either to help the existing human judicial clerk to then help the judge, or maybe for judges that don't have human clerks at all. Maybe they can get a, a programmatic judicial clerk. Because what would often happen with that bench memo, and I would find over my 10 hours of doing that work, I would realize for claim number one, there are four elements to those claims, and the plaintiff missed element three. Therefore, that plaintiff loses. They, they can't prove thing number three. But it took me 10 hours to figure that out. So maybe now the judge, in minutes, could be able to say, hey, this party is missing any evidence to show a number three. So this case goes away. So this is not robots deciding cases, but this is instead robots augmenting the human judgment to be able to do what a judicial clerk did more quickly. And so then I, as a judge, can be able to more quickly bring my humanness to this. So I'm not worried about judges being replaced by robots. I don't think that's going to happen and should never happen. But I think that we can really accelerate the access to justice through judicial opinions. And I think that um, there are aspects of judging uh, that, you know, when we did criminal cases, my judge would say, I want to see the quiver in that uh, defendant's eye to see if they're really contrite, if they're really sorry for what they've, did, they've done. And that will affect whether I, how I sentence them. Uh, and so in that way, uh, there's, it's going to be a long time before that quiver in the eye is going to make it into a data set for mm -hmm. a robot to be able to then say, yes, they are very contrite. Um, so we probably still need that humanness to be able to determine the quiver in the eye. That's argument one. Uh, but the counter argument to that, uh, that I just spoke with a the professor, they said, but that seeing the quiver in the eye is a bias. Uh, that is a human bias. And maybe that person is faking the quiver, right? And so then they're trying to game that human. Uh, so wouldn't it be better to have algorithmic justice uh, rather than playing to that human bias? Um, so there are very good arguments uh, for keeping humans and very good arguments for eliminating humans and maybe having a less biased system because you can be able to find the bias in the machine, uh, but finding the bias in the flesh and bones of the human, uh, that is very hard, if not impossible to do. I had very interesting uh, episode of of the podcast about uh, correcting biases, human biases by machine biases uh, and uh, biases of machines accompanied by uh, humans biases. So it's still really open open case. I would be afraid a bit about uh, the the mm, apps not being too transparent and uh, and this this could be an obstacle to to accept it very very wide but as a supportive tool for judges i i would agree i was supporting this this position and i think the the fast justice is is one of the most important points of access to justice at all and the rule of law that's right uh, uh, yeah my, my judge would often say justice delayed is justice denied so yes. let's make justice faster in europe we have great problems with uh really delayed justice uh, probably in the us in some cases is is the same but you you cover also ip rights and uh, ai what's your opinion uh, about generative ai and its impact on on ip rights especially my like about the recent disputes that uh, are pending in in the us how how do you approach it 
Yes. Uh, so whether it be the GitHub Copilot case, uh, where, which regards code, uh, or the New York Times case, uh, or the stability case, all of them uh, rotated my view on the idea expression dichotomy. Uh, I practice copyright law, and under copyright law in the United States and in most countries worldwide, ideas are uncopyrightable. You cannot copyright ideas. Mm -hmm. You can only copyright the human-made expressions of those ideas, and only those expressions that are original can you copyright it. If it is unoriginal, it is still uncopyrightable. So when you think about how a large language model or any generative AI works, what it's doing is um, it's think about it like plotting it on a 2D graph. So you have an x-axis and then you have a y-axis. And it's really clustering together something like, um, what is the statistically likely next word of I drove my blank? I drove my car, automobile, truck, van. Each one of those on that x-y axis is clustered somewhere. Uh, and so really what the large language model is doing is clustering car, automobile, truck, and van in that X, Y axis. Uh, but then uh, you can add a third axis, a Z axis, to make it 3D. Now think about how where that lives. Now add a fourth axis. And you can't, because we humans can't even think about 4D. Mm -hmm. um, now think about 10D. Think about 100D. And now think about 12,000D. And that's where large language models are. So somewhere in that 12,000 dimensional space is Bob Dylan-ness and Pablo Picasso-ness and Ernest Hemingway-ness. So these are all ideas, uh, and you cannot copyright those ideas. And so the, uh, what the large language model did when it ran through the New York Times and what it does when it goes through every book is it's taking the ideas, that is the uncopyrightable ideas, and then it's throwing away the particular expressions of those. So throwing away the copyrightable things, but only leaving the uncopyrightable ideas of the things. Um, and then people say, well, how did the large language model, when the New York Times ingested the first eight paragraphs of the article uh, and said, tell me what's statistically likely to finish, GPT finished up that article because, of course, given eight paragraphs, it's, of course, going to finish up the article. Um, that is what's called in uh, cybersecurity red teaming. That is, you're trying to get the system to do something the system was not supposed to do. And in those types of cases, uh, the red teaming, uh, that person who is doing the red teaming is the primary infringer. And the person that, uh, the tool that's being used at best is the secondary infringer. An example of this is the Sony Betamax case from the 1980s, where uh, people, the, you know, the video industry and the entertainment industry sued the VCR companies, saying this could be used to download HBO and other movies, uh, to not download, but to record them. But the court in the United States Supreme Court said, well, the VCR could be used for that, but there are substantial non-infringing uses. That is, you could also use it to record your kid's baseball game. You could also do it to record your child's musical, right? Um, these are substantial non-infringing uses that uh, we should have VCRs because these are substantial non-infringing uses. So in the same way, ChatGPT, um, yes, you could red team it to do this, but are there substantial non-infringing uses uh, for this? And the answer is, of course they are. Think of the millions of substantial non-infringing uses. So as we think about, um, you know, it's collecting mere ideas, not the expressions of those ideas. And, uh, you know, OpenAI and the others are trying to keep the red teamers from hacking it to be able to get the output that is the same. Um, but that should, that's on the infringer, not on the tool. Just like it's on the infringer that's downloading the HBO show and not on the VCR uh, that allows it. So what's your prediction about the outcomes of, of the, the disputes? Well, I can say what the law should do, and I've pretty laid out a pretty good argument as to what the law should do. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, as a litigator, know that uh, what should happen is very different. What courts ultimately decide will happen, and what juries decide will happen. So I don't know if I will make a prediction. Um, Yogi Berra, the philosopher, said that uh, predicting, uh, predicting is very hard, especially about the future. Uh, so I'm not going to predict. But I would say that if uh, OpenAI leans into and Microsoft leans into the argument I've just made, I think they will be much more statistically likely to win than if they didn't. Okay. Uh, it's really interesting because in Europe we have a bit different framework where data may or uh, LLMs may be trained by the data unless you opt out. So 
so it's it's a bit different and more specific, but also it's it's still disputable in Europe. I will ask you one final question. I saw your uh, podcast about music, math, uh, open sourcing of uh, melodies. It was recorded four years ago. Uh, would you change it uh, right now when we talk about generative AI uh, or say the same or you did probably something else? Yes, I, 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 I maybe we'll give you an update on that project, and then I'll also talk about a new project I'm doing. Uh, the update is that, um, and for those who don't know about my TED Talk on all the music, um, what I've done is I've I'll copyrighted... I'll link it to, to oh, the good. podcast. Uh, good. So. Yeah, so so the um, all the music. What we've done is we've uh, we've copyrighted 471 billion melodies, and the way we've done that is through brute force. You could brute force a pod, uh, You can brute force a password by going a a a a a b a a c until you mathematically uh, exhaust all the possibilities to brute force your password. We've done that with music. So we've gone do 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 re do do mi do do fa until we've mathematically exhausted every melody that's ever been and every melody that ever can be to the tune of 471 billion melodies. Once they're written to disk, as we did, they are copyrighted under the Bern Convention. So we've copyrighted 471 billion melodies, and then we placed everything into the public domain under Creative Commons Zero. Uh, and so the purpose of this is to help you stole my melody lawsuit defendants. That is people that are accused of stealing someone else's melody. So an update to my TED Talk, which has been seen now 2 million times, is that every defendant before my talk has lost, and every defendant after my talk has used my arguments and has won. So Katy Perry, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, Ed Sheeran twice, once in the United Kingdom and once in, the, in uh, the United States, all of them have argued what I argued in my talk, that maybe those melodies are building blocks of music that are unoriginal, that are for uncopyrightable. Uh, so none of them has cited me, and correlation is not causation, but there's very good correlation that before my talk, everyone has lost, and after my talk, everyone has won. And now since then, uh, last week uh, in South by Southwest, I presented on the All the Music Project and then announced a new project, and it's called All the Patents. And what we've done for All the Patents Project is uh, Mike Bomarito and Dan Katz and Noah, uh, Noah Rubin, who um, is my collaborator on the All the Music Project, um, Mike said to me, Damien, I really liked your copyright thing. Let's do the same thing for patents. And so what we're doing is we're taking every single patent that's ever been filed. And then each of those patents has many claims, say 10 claims. And then what we're doing is we're taking all of those claims and they're re then we are recombining them into new inventions. And then we're publishing those inventions. And once they're published, they are prior art. That is, you can't get an invention. You cannot get a patent on something that's already been invented. And so what we will then do is that if someone files a new patent that has the same claims as something that we put up there, we will then programmatically send a letter to the patent examiner to say, hey, take a look at this. We actually invented this in March of 2024. So you in December of 2024 cannot invent it because we've already done that. Uh, so this is a way um, that we can be able to bring the patent system back to what it was originally intended for, and that is to create innovation. Because whether it be copyright or patent, what we're really doing as a government is we're saying, we are going to do something bad for humanity, and that is give you a monopoly on something. Monopolies are generally bad, but we're going to do this bad thing to benefit humanity because we need more writing in the copyright side, and we need more inventions on the patent side. So we're going to do the bad monopoly to be able to do a good with being able to do more new things. And so what we're doing with this patent, patent project is to encourage the new things. Because if you were to not recombine old things, but to really inject a new thing, a new claim that has never been done before, cool, our project will not affect you. But it's only if you recombine old things into something that is just a recombination, that is unoriginal. And under the patents, you shouldn't get an unoriginal patent. And ours will help enforce that fact that it is truly an unoriginal recombination. Do you use generative AI to 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 do it? Yes, uh, we we do. Uh, so there's uh, the Dan Katz and Mike Bomarito. They have a company called Two Seven Three Ventures. Uh, it's a play on uh, minus two seven three. Uh, Kelvin is absolute zero. Uh, so what they've done is they've ingested uh, trillions of tokens uh, and created a legal large language model. And what they've ingested is cases, statutes, regulations, contracts, uh, all sorts of legal data, and put it together, including patent data. And so we're using their foundational model 
their legal large language model to be able to uh, both uh, put each of the claims into vector space and also to generate the new claims, the new inventions in this way. Uh, so yes, we are using large language both for the extraction and then also the generation. I hope uh, this succeeds as, as the musician project. Damien, thank you very much for the discussion. All the topics you cover are, are really great and uh, the discussion is also really great. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I, I'm really honored to be on your, as your guest and I'd be happy to come back whenever you'd like. Thank you. Thank you.